We know that we're living in an increasingly tech-savvy world, but if we examine our tech-savviness through the words we search for and the way we search for things on the internet, you'll see we're not quite as tech-savvy as some of us originally thought. For example, Facebook remains the top search for term in the Google search engine, followed closely by the word Google itself. Since all you have to do is add .com to either one of these two terms to save yourself the trouble of searching at all, it seems like maybe we could be putting these powerful search engines to greater use. We need to get better at searching and we need to understand how the internet works and how we can effectively search it so that we can find the information we need and put this very powerful tool to work for us. How does Google work? Here's a simple explanation. Google and other search engines crawl the internet looking for new content and new websites. They then rank that content in those websites based on a variety of factors. For example, they look at how reliable that source has been over time. So something like the New York Times or CNN is always going to receive a higher ranking than myrandomblog.com. They also look at how many other sites link back to those original sites. So if a lot of people are linking back to an article or a web page, that's an endorsement saying this is good content. And it's an even better endorsement if another high ranking site links back to it. When you type words into your Google search, Google's looking for how those words are configured on the page. They're looking for the specific word order you searched for, and they're looking for where it occurs on the page. So if those words appear, maybe one on the top and one on the bottom, that's not going to come up as high in the page ranking as a website where those two weird words appear right next to each other, right on the top of the page. We'll look more at how you can determine if you've made a successful search and whether the site you got to is actually giving you the information you need. But first, let's look at a few things that you can do within the Google search engine. First of all, you probably knew that there's a simple calculator built right into the search bar. So if you type in a problem, you get a quick answer and an interactive calculator where you can even continue your multiplication problems right here within the browser. You can do more than just translate what is, you know, 45 times 24. You can also translate how many US dollars are there in, I don't know, 7 euros. By doing a simple Google search, you'll see that at least today it's 9.11 US dollars. You can also do a translation language to language within Google. So using Google Translate, if I say how many US dollars are in 7 euros, I can see it right here in Spanish or if I want, I suppose, in Arabic or many other different languages. Sometimes a simple search can get you so many results that it's really hard to know how to narrow them down. For example, a search for lower back pain is finding every single website that has the word lower back and pain in it, something like 74 million websites. But by simply adding the word stretching, so here I'm saying I want websites that have lower back pain plus the word stretching in them, I get it down to only 131 results. That is actually attainable. And if I want ones that don't mention narcotics at all and really only talk about stretching in terms of lower back pain, you can see I further refine it down to an incredibly manageable 126 results. This is a huge improvement over the 73 million we were looking for at first. Let's look at a few more of the features that are available in search. First of all, up here on the top uh, next to web, you've got a bunch of other search terms that are available for you. By putting lower back pain in parentheses, I only look for websites that have those three words in that exact order. You'll see that, see that still gives me over 9 million websites to choose from. But what about images? Here I'm finding images related to lower back pain. And if I like this one that's got this kind of blue tint and this one, I can look for only images in the color blue, for example. And I come up with some pretty common images that would certainly go well together in a PowerPoint or something like that. This would be a good image to use. I can tell because it's about a thousand pixels across and my screen on my computer is about a thousand pixels across. So I know that's going to fill it up very well. A smaller image like this one that's only 350 pixels across is only going to take up about a quarter of my screen. So if I blow it up in a presentation, it's really not going to look that good. So once you've done your search, how can you tell if the sites you found are reputable? Well, this requires some just basic digital citizenship. First of all, you need to start by asking yourself a couple of questions. Number one, what is your personal motive? What are you looking for? Are you looking for the kind of information that you might give to a client as an overview of a condition? Or are you really looking for some deeper medical 
um, data and background information that you might use with your uh, professional colleagues. And number two, uh, consider what your clients are reading and be ready to either reinforce or debunk the most common things that, that they're likely finding on the internet. So there's no real hard and fast rule for saying, all right, this is a trusted site and this one isn't. But there are five things to consider when you're looking at sites on the internet that should help you determine if the information you're getting is more valuable. Number one, you need to look at the purpose of the site. If the first thing your eyes go to on a website is the ads on that site, then the purpose of the site is probably more about ad revenue generation than it is about information delivery, and it's likely not going to be a good source of information for you or for your clients. Number two, is the site run by a respected institution or authored by a well-known or awarded expert? This is a really important thing to consider because information that we find on the Mayo's website is going to be instantly more reliable to us than information that we find on another site like about.com or Wikipedia. Number three, did you get to this website from another website you trust? So if I'm on the U of M's medical site and they link me off to a research article, that research article is going to have more credibility than if I just found it on the Google image search, for example. Number four, can we verify the information with other searches? So if you find information that seems to be unique to one single website and we can't verify it anybody anywhere else, that's likely not very good information. And number five, is the information presented in a clear and accessible manner. Just like anything professional, people who really care put a lot of time and work into how they present their information online. So paying attention to how carefully information is presented both visually and from the wording of the actual description will give us a really good indicator of whether or not this is going to be a valuable source of information for us and for our clients. With those five things in mind, Let's look at information about carpal tunnel and see what we can find on a variety of different websites. Now the first thing you're going to notice on Google is that we get 14 million results. We have a nice little description over here on the side from the National Library of Medicine and a link to their article right here on the top. Right up on the top we also have Wikipedia and about.com. Probably not the most valuable sources of medical information but information we should be aware of since because it's near the top it's something our clients might click on. If we want to see images of carpal tunnel we'll just click here on the image tab and we can see all kinds of images that might be helpful as we're explaining how carpal tunnel works and how it feels and how you might seek treatment. This picture right here of a hand with the drawing on the outside for example might give a client a better understanding about what's happening underneath their skin and um, there are other nice indicators here about where pain goes and how treatment is delivered. Now if we look at Bing, we see really very similar information, only 2 million results, a few ads up here on the top, but the same basic websites are showing up here on the top of our Bing search as showed up at the top of our Google search. And we also get a nice mix of images and other information here. Now one of the first sites that both of those link to is this uh, National Library of Medicine. If we look at this site, we'll see it delivers some pretty good information, but it really fails at our fifth uh, indicator in terms of is a site valuable. And that is, it's really not presented in a very aesthetically pleasing way. And so it's probably not going to draw a reader in. It's not going to be the kind of thing that your clients are going to gravitate towards. So it's likely not going to be anybody's first source of information. But it does uh, rank high on being a trusted source of information because it is from the um, National Library of Medicine. If we look at WebMD, this does a nice job of giving us information from a trusted source. We know WebMD in the past has been a valuable source of information. It is presented in an attractive manner. They do a really nice job of breaking things up. But it fails us a little bit in the purpose category because we can see that the ads are really the, pr the prominent features on the page and sometimes that can be distracting uh, uh, from the information that we're actually trying to consider here. If we go to about.com 
we find a similar problem, except the ads are even more prominent here. Here we've got ads running on both sides of the page. They really seem to be the total focus of the page, and the article itself seems to be an afterthought. So um, I don't use about.com as a valuable source of information here. There are no ads on Wikipedia, so we don't have that to pick on, but it does uh, cause a problem for us, uh, at least in terms of is this actually valuable information? Usually what Wikipedia gives us is a nice eighth grade summary of what a certain uh, diagnosis looks like or what a certain treatment looks like. But here, uh, with this one, we see a really kind of complex description that doesn't seem to do much to help with our explanation at all. So I'm dismissing this. And there's also, of course, other issues related with um, Wikipedia. Since we can't singularly determine the authorship of this site, it fails us a little bit in the um, trusted area. Now looking at the U of M, we start to see a site that really begins to bring together the different elements we're looking for. The purpose of this site is clear. There are no ads on this site. It really is just focusing right on to um, the problem at hand. This is a trusted site because we trust the U of M Medical Center. Uh, we didn't get the link from anywhere else, but you can see that there are links from within the site itself. We can verify this information on other sites, and the site is really very, very well done. We see the simple image up here on the top, and then a very brief, concise, and accurate description about what carpal tunnel is and how we might begin to treat it. You see a very similar treatment on the Mayo's website. A brief overview right here about what carpal tunnel is and why Mayo Clinic is a good place to get treatment. And then separate tabs broken up for diagnosis, for treatment, how we set up appointments, what are the clinical, clinical trials like. All really helpful information for us presented in a very concise fashion. And you can see in terms of a few areas, the Mayo Clinic's website ranks very high. First of all, we've, we know it to be a trusted source. Secondly, it's very well done. The information is very concise. It's broken up so we don't have to look at all three of these things at once. We can look at overview, diagnosis, and treatment separately. So we're just getting the specific information we need. Another site that I thought would be a good source of information is Health Partners, but it turns out that information delivery, at least in the area of carpal tunnel, does not seem to be their strong suit. And what we get is just a link to other pages that also have links on them. So um, that was kind of a no-go for us. The last site I examined is this one right here. Now this is a database of information. The Medical Disability Advisor shows us really good information. And I was um, very struck by um, how nicely this uh, done this was. It gives us a nice picture, good, um, concise information. Everything's on one page, unlike the Mayo site, but I thought that was um, worked very nicely here. So out of all of these searches, uh, we come up with this site right here, the Mayo site, and the U of M site as being really good, accurate sources of information. The next thing for us is going to be to actually carefully read the information here and then cross-compare it to the other two sites that we found valuable and see if we're starting to get some common treatment ideas and some good indicators about how we might move forward in the treatment of carpal tunnel. Finally, let's consider how search is expanding and the role of social media. Now search continues to evolve. It used to be that typing a full sentence into Google was the sign of an uninformed searcher. But now with the addition of Siri and Google Now, you can speak a question into your phone or type a full sentence into the Google search bar and come back with really good results. Moreover, predictive search is starting to anticipate the kinds of things we need before we ever search for them at all. That said, some things simply aren't Googleable, And for those, we need to expand our whole thinking around searching. We need our own professional network of trusted colleagues and industry leaders. In education, we refer to this as a professional learning network. Of course, you have your company colleagues and the network of other professionals you've met over the course of your career. So if you have a question like this, or this, contacting your trusted colleagues might be your best bet. Therefore, having a wide network is extremely valuable. 
You can expand your network by taking advantage of social networking sites such as Twitter. How do you get started? Well, once you have an account, follow your own colleagues and then look for others in your expanded professional network. Follow the people they follow and look for organizations like CMSA that provide trusted advice. Looking through their followers can give you even more contacts. Like any network, you have to contribute as well as ask for advice. So commit to checking in with your network on a regular basis and give back as often as possible. As you move forward, examine your professional network and practice good searching. Take full advantage of your search engine's capability and examine sites for purpose, credibility, and quality while verifying the information through cross-references. By becoming a more critical searcher, you'll increase efficiency and improve the accuracy of your results. Good luck!